Good morning, church. You guys doing good? All right. Here we go. Well, if you're new, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I want to welcome all of our campuses, Ole and Arcade, Jingle House, Wellsville. We're glad that you guys are with us, as well as our online viewers. As you see, we're starting a brand new message series today called Rediscovering Christmas. From time to time, we need to go back to familiar stories in Scripture and be reminded of what Christmas is all about. You know, the the emphasis on extravagant gifts and holiday sales and elaborate decorations really ruined the main reason for the season. Uh, even Christmas movies. I, I, I love Christmas movies this time of year. And even though I've seen them like over and over and over again, it's just kind of fun and nostalgic to watch them. But they miss the mark as well when they choose to focus on a subplot that is anything but a biblical theme of what Christmas is about, of love and peace and hope and, and joy. For example, all-time classic Christmas movie, right? Jingle all the way. It's got to be top, what, 50 Christmas movies, maybe 100? I don't know. But the, the picture here, Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you remember this, this movie, the story revolves around this kid wanting this toy. I even forgot the name of the toy. But this father went all out, all out at the expense of relationships in his life to find this toy. What's the moral of this story? Consumerism, greed, materialism, right? Or I'll give you another example, another classic, Christmas with the Cranks, right? Remember this? This, this story revolves around a neighborhood's obsession with holiday decorations over-focusing on the true spirit of Christmas. Now, while these movies are, you know, humorous and they're entertaining to, to watch, they also show the cultural shift to materialism, to consumerism, to romanticism even. Uh, in fact, even decorations that you see around, either at the mall or in people's houses, show this. For example, here's a nice, beautiful house. And where's Jesus? You know what I mean? Like, you've got Frosty, you've got Minions, you've got Penguins galore, you got a dog, you got Santa. It looks like someone vomited Christmas onto this house. And it's so beautiful. So nice to look at. Versus, how about this? Just the simplicity. I love this decoration. It's the simplicity of what Christmas is all about. A baby and a manger, parents and an angel, and a donkey. That's, that's it. That's all you get, and that's all there is. Imagine if an alien just showed up on our planet, though, and they saw the majority of the houses decorated with penguins and, you know, minions and very few of these. What do you think they would conclude that this time of year is all about? And so all that to say, and you know this, right? Our culture, our culture seems to have lost the meaning of Christmas. You know that. I mean, that's pretty obvious. I don't need to belabor that point, but perhaps this is a better question to ask. Have you lost the meaning of Christmas? Have you lost the meaning of what the season's all about? This past week, I read a um, really great devotional by A.W. Tozer from his book, From Heaven, and, okay, we're familiar with that. And uh, in his chapter... Uh, titled, I think it's the first chapter, Christmas Reformation Long Overdue, he, he writes these words. He says, the star of Bethlehem could not lead a wise man to Christ today. Think about that. It could not distinguish amid the millions of artificial lights hung aloft on Main Street. In our mad materialism, we have turned beauty into ashes and made merchants of the holiest gift the world ever knew. And then he says this, Christ came to bring peace and we celebrate his coming by making peace impossible for six weeks of each year. He came to free us out of debt, and many respond by going deep into debt for the sake of buying gifts for people who do not appreciate them. And then he brings, up, brings out the big guns. He says, we substitute Santa Claus for Christ as the chief object of popular interest. And I think he got it right. And that's my concern too, not for our culture, because I can't do anything about that, but my concern is for you and I that we have the right focus, that you and I would 
know and we would treasure what Christmas is all about. Not just know a story, because I'm pretty certain you guys know the story or most of the story. My concern is not that we just know a story in our head, but we treasure the story in our heart so that it makes a difference in our lives. And um, it's so that we don't get distracted by all the things that most people get distracted by during this time of year. You know, I love the song, it's the most wonderful time of the year. I can do more show tunes too if you want. But it should be. This time of year should be the most wonderful time of the year, but not for the reasons that people have given you. This season is the most wonderful time of the year because it causes us to slow down and to truly do what Mary did, to ponder in our hearts the incarnation, to ponder in our hearts Emmanuel, God with us, to ponder in our hearts that our Savior, while he was in his mother's womb, literally held the planets in orbit. That's an incredible thought. And that's the reason why this time should be the most wonderful time of the year. Unfortunately, all these amazing truths usually get lost amidst all the hustle and bustle of our world, uh, miss popular music and movies, sales and holiday discounts, ham and eggnog. And don't get me wrong, I love me some eggnog, right? But it gets lost in the movies and all the different stories and Rudolph and his pimple nose and Santa with his sleigh. And I'm not a hater. Like, I'm not trying to hate on any of that, right? But what a shame. What a shame it would be if we reduce the most amazing truth in all of human history, that God became one of us to the most small, meaningless things that our culture can provide. So that's why some of us, many of us, need to rediscover Christmas. And part of rediscovering Christmas, and this is what we're going to talk about this week, is that before there was a manger, there was a tree. And not just a Christmas tree, a family tree. Check this out. In Matthew chapter 1, this is where we're going to be. Matthew chapter 1, it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Verse 3, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Salmon, who liked to swim upstream, the father of Boaz by Rahab, thank you, and by Boaz the father of Obed by, hey, we just learned about her, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Verse 16, we'll jump ahead, I I won't read the whole thing, but it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Am I the only one who's ever read some of those genealogies in the Bible, and you're like, and they just skip, you know, you just skip to the next passage or the next chapter? How riveting, how exciting the way the story of Christmas starts. But you would make a mistake if you just skimmed past this genealogy. Notice when Matthew retells the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, which, is, which includes his birth narrative, Jesus' birth narrative account, he's not so much concerned about telling a story as he is concerned about telling history. Do you notice that? Before he, he, he gets to all the other details that you and I associate Christmas with, the manger, the star, the, the wise men, the shepherds, the angels, and all that, Before he tells any of those details, more than concerning himself with a story, he is concerning himself with history. History. And so here's what I want you to see. When we allow Scripture to retell the story of Christmas, we see this, that Christmas, Christmas is more than just a birth. It's about a promise coming. More than just a birth... It's a promise in the making, and that's what we need to see. So while it's true that, that, um, that Christmas is about the birth of Jesus, don't get me wrong, it's about so much more. It's about so much more. And so what I want to do uh, today is simply ask and answer this question. How does the genealogy of Jesus help us rediscover the meaning of Christmas? How does Jesus' family lineage and family tree help us truly understand 
the significance and the importance of Christmas. And so I'm going to share with you a few thoughts. And the first one is this. Christmas is good news, not merely a good story. Christmas is first and foremost good news, not just a good story to be told. In fact, we don't need any more good stories. There's, Christmas is full of good stories. Like we have plenty of stories to go around. We're not short on Christmas stories. I, 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 have, um, I have seen more Christmas movies with Christmas stories than I care to admit. Like you have probably watched so many on a Hallmark channel, right? There's, there's tons of them. Uh, some of my favorite Christmas movies, in case you're wondering, It's a Wonderful Life. This is a classic. Uh, I ran a couple of people who are younger, younger than the age of 40, that they didn't even know what this was. Like, I'm just like, this is like literally the most popular movie in the history of the world, probably. It's a Wonderful Life. Here, here's another one. One of our favorites to watch every single year, the day after Thanksgiving, Christmas vacation. Um, yeah. So what's the next one? The Christmas story. How many of you have seen this, you know, over, under, over, under? How many of you have seen this over a million times, right? Okay, everybody, yeah. Because it's on every single day, every other hour on TV. Uh, or here's, here's another one. Elf, this is one of our kids' favorite, you know. We actually bought them last year for Christmas spaghetti and candy to put in their spaghetti. It didn't go over too well, but it was a fun memory. Uh, and here's, here's another one. Of course, Home Alone, all-time classic. It's like there's all kinds of Christmas stories that you and I have been exposed to. Story, 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 story. So when Christmas becomes just another story, that's a problem. But that's not how Matthew portrays this event, this narrative, this, this story. In fact, look at how he begins the passage that we just read. And I'll show you how he he um, puts a bookend to this passage. Look at verse 1. He says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. David, Abraham, all the other people listed in that genealogy are historical figures. It's a book, and the book is a genealogy. It's not a fairy tale. And then look what it says in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place... In this way. In other words, notice what Matthew doesn't say. Matthew doesn't start off his gospel by saying this Once upon a time, a baby named Jesus was born. Once upon a time. That's not how he starts because it's not a once upon a time story. Once upon a time stories are great for fiction, they have good morals and principles and lessons, and oftentimes give good advice. But is that all that Christmas is? Is it just a bunch of good advice. No, of course not. In fact, I've, I've said this before. You've probably heard other people say it before as well, but, but the gospel is good news, not merely good advice. The gospel is good news, not just good advice. So, so what's the difference between news and advice? News and advice. Well, advice is counsel about what you must do. It's what you got to do. Where news is a report about what's already been done. Advice puts the emphasis on you to act. But news tells you someone else has acted on your behalf. So I love how Luke, I'm going to jump from Matthew to Luke. Look what Luke says of the angel's announcement about the birth of Christ to the shepherds in the field. He says this in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And the angel said to them, to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you Christmas cookies? Or, what does he say? Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So the angel calls to the shepherds, I've got some good news for you. Before Christmas was anything else, before the glitz and the glamour, the tinsel and the traditions, the lights and all the, the stuff that you and I participated in, before it was anything, it was just news. It was news. And it was good. And because it was good news, it actually caused some joy in people's hearts. In other words, if you look at what verse 11 says, it puts it all into perspective. He says this, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Born to you a Savior. 
That's why the angel said to the shepherd, hey, what I'm about to tell you, it's good. And what I'm about to tell you is not only good, but it's going to produce joy in you because this is God gift wrapping you the greatest Christmas present that you could ever ask or imagine. It is literally salvation on behalf of God for you. In other words, the the angels are saying this, if I could summarize Christmas. Christmas is the good news about a super generous gift that has been provided for you. That's what it is. It's not Santa in a mall. It's not the light show. It's not anything else. It's simply good news about a super, super generous gift that was given for you. That's what Christmas is about. Of course, Christmas can include some other things, some family and traditions, but ultimately it's got to be centered on that. And ultimately Christmas has massive implications for how you live your life. But here's what I want you to know. First and foremost, it is the good news that you need to be saved. You absolutely need to be saved if you are to understand Christmas. So so Christmas is God providing salvation for you, for unto you is born this day a Savior. So we should probably ask ourselves if that's the case and that's the the reason for Christmas, do I believe this good news? Do 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 I believe in not a story, but do I believe in like this news? This, this history, do I believe in it? Do I really believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago? Not as a man, but as in the, in the form of a little baby. Do I really believe he grew up and lived the perfect life? Do I really believe the Romans and the Jews crucified him on a Roman cross? And do I really believe that he rose from the grave? Do I really believe that this happened? Did it happen? If the answer to that question is yes, it changes everything. Like, it changes your past, your present, your future. It changes how you live your life. It literally alters human history. So the story of Christmas is not best told once upon a time. It's best told when we share the truth that God invaded our time, and he changed our lives. So that's the first thing that will help us rediscover Christmas from this passage in Matthew chapter 1. The second thing is this. Christmas welcomes in those who are outside. Christmas welcomes in those who are outside. You know, in that culture, genealogies, this is what we've been reading, genealogies, they did a couple things, one of which was expected. is what we think of genealogies. Genealogies in that day told you who was in your family, who was your uncle, who was your, uh, who was your aunt, and who was your cousin, who was your grandfather, who, and who was their dad, and who was their mom. But it also told you Another thing, it acted as a resume, so to speak. You know, they, they weren't so individualistic as we were. They were very, very family-oriented. And so the line in which you came from told, you, told others a lot about who you were. So this is, when you gave your genealogy, this is you saying, this is me. And this is what qualifies me because these are my people. And what's interesting about that is Matthew doesn't do that. The whole point of a resume is to impress people. Matthew's not concerned about that. He's just telling it is, uh, he's just telling you how it is and and who's in Jesus' lineage. So, for example, we can look at his his lineage. There's there's five five women, uh, which would have been unheard of to list in the genealogy. Uh, Women usually were not listed in that form, especially in a patriarchal society, and yet Matthew includes them. From that list, there's three outsiders or foreigners, or the Bible calls them Gentiles. And to a Jew, a Gentile would have been completely unclean. You had to avoid them at all costs. And yet here you have Matthew including not just some women, but some Gentile women as well. So it's got five women, three outsiders, and plenty of sin. Plenty of sin. If you read through the genealogies, you will find, if you dig a little deeper into their backstories, just some of the most sinful stories you could ever imagine. 
Uh, let me give you a few instances. We looked at Tamar's story last week. Remember Tamar from Genesis chapter 38? Here's the long story short. She has a husband, he dies. Leveret Law says the Mosaic Laws gave permission, pr provision for a wife, a widow, to get a husband from the deceased brother's brother. So the brother comes into the picture, they marry. Tamar marries this, this brother. He dies because he did what was evil in the Lord. So another brother comes in. They marry. He does what was evil in the Lord. So he dies. And Judah, the dad, is like, I ain't giving you another son, and you're just going to kill my boys. And so he says, no. She tries to get revenge. She dresses herself up like a prostitute, disguises herself so he couldn't see who it was. She gets pregnant. He wants to kill her until he realizes that he's the one at fault. That's in Jesus' genealogy. Okay, it gets worse. Rahab, Rahab the prostitute, a Canaanite prostitute. Remember from Joshua chapter 2, the spies are sent in to kind of survey the land, the promised land. They go to Jericho, and they run into some problems. And so Rahab gets them out of there, and the Israelites spare her life. And because of her generosity to these spies, she's grafted in. A prostitute Canaanite is grafted into the family line of Jesus. And then there's, I don't know if you caught this, but there's this person called Uriah's wife. Now, who is that? On the count of three, if you know it, shout it out. One, two, three. Bathsheba. It's interesting. Why? didn't Matthew just say Bathsheba? He's listing all these other people in Jesus' genealogy. This is the only instance where he calls an individual by some other person's name or you know, relative. So why does, he do, why does he do this? Because he's bringing attention to us, the, the readers, of, of really David's shady past. I don't know if you know uh, who Uriah was. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Trusted friend, trusted friend, who David stole his wife and tried to cover it up. His plan didn't work, and so he goes to plan B, and he puts Uriah on the front lines of the battle, guaranteeing that he gets killed. So literally, David's an adulterer, and he's a murderer. I love what one commentator said says, Matthew leaves out Bathsheba's name not as a slight on Bathsheba, but as a slam on David. This was David's history. So this genealogy, when you look at it, it's full of outsiders, full of outsiders. You've got moral outsiders like David and, and Uriah's wife. You've got racial outsiders like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. Remember her? All these outsiders, and so here's what I want you to see when you understand the history behind this. What I want you to see is that the law of Moses actually excluded these people from the presence of God, and yet they're all publicly acknowledged as the ancestors of Jesus, which means those who were once excluded are now included. Those who were once on the outside have now the opportunity to come into the family of God. The other thing I want you to see is this, that the genealogy of Jesus is a reminder that everyone needs grace. Here's what I mean. The, the, the bad guys need grace and the good, good guys need grace, okay? The, the bad guys need grace and the good guys need grace. Um, the people who are excluded by culture and the Mosaic law needed grace in order to come into the family of God. And so that tells you it doesn't matter your past, it doesn't matter your baggage, your, 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 your shame, your spiritual resume, that if you come to Jesus and repent of your sins and call on him to forgive you and to believe on the cross and the resurrection, your sins will be wiped away and not held against you. That is the grace of God. And that's the grace of God you need. This is the grace of God for bad guys among us. But it's also the grace of God for Good guys, case in point, David. David's not an outsider, he's an insider. David's not a, a woman, he's a man. He's not a peasant, he's a king. He's a good guy. He's a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. And what this genealogy tells us is that even David 
needed the grace of God. So if you didn't grow up in church and you've got one of those stories, like, you know, you, you did some really bad things in your past, you're welcome in. And if you grew up in church and you knew all the Sunday school stories, you still need God's grace to get in. And so it's for the good guys and the bad guys. And then finally, I want you, I want you to see this. From, from this story, God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. That's what the genealogy shows us. And, and why do I say that? It's because that phrase at the beginning of the, the verse that we read, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. Abraham, first of all, Jesus is not Abraham's son directly. You, you understand that, right? There were some other generations in there, quite a few actually. In fact, we didn't read verse 17 where it says there was 14 generations here, 14 generations here, 14 generations there. That's, that's a long time for this story to be unfolded. And it shows us something very, very important. It points us all the way back to Abraham. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God promises through his family all the world, which includes you, will be blessed. Look what he says. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here's what's interesting about this passage, and what's interesting about Matthew referring back to Abraham. When we read the story of Christmas in the New Testament, there's this beautiful scene where Mary is told that she is going to have the child. And, she, and what's in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you remember what her response was? It was joy. In fact, she was jo so joyful that she writes a song that's recorded in Scripture. It's called Mary's Magnificat. And in it, here's what she said in verses 54 and 55 of Luke. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to who? To Abraham and to his offspring forever. So what's Mary doing? She's bringing it back full circle. And she brings it back all the way to Abraham as if to say this story of what we're witnessing has been a long, long time coming. And I don't know if you know this, but Isaiah, where we get, uh, for unto us a child is born, uh, unto us a son is given, and he gives all the different predictions and prophecies of the coming Messiah. If you read Isaiah, that's 700 years before the birth of Christ. And then the end of your Old Testament, the last prophet before the beginning of the New Testament, there's a period, it doesn't seem that long because it's a page, but there's a period of 400 years where God doesn't speak. And it's almost as if he had, for, he had forgotten about his people. It's almost as if they would have felt like they, that God had abandoned them. But at just the right time, he showed up. And it just goes to show that God does not operate, and some of you know this really well, but God does not operate on our own calendar. It just doesn't work that way. He doesn't operate on your clock, on your schedule. And that's a good thing. And we know this, right? We know this. We've experienced this. Sometimes it seems like God's timing is completely wrong. You pray about something, and he doesn't answer. You pray for healing, and he doesn't answer. You pray for this relationship, and he doesn't move. You're wanting this job, but somehow that door got shut in your face. And it seems like the things that you're trusting God for, the things that you want on your timetable, don't come to fruition. But if you've lived life for a good season, some of you are a little bit older and you can testify to this. When you look back in the rear view mirror of your life and you see those things that you wanted in an instant or wanted that next week or that next day, God did something amazing through those seasons of life and did something in you that would not otherwise be possible if he didn't take you through that time. And here's what you find. You find this. You realize that it's clear that God's timing is completely right. Well, sometimes it seems like God's timing is completely wrong until it becomes clear that his timing is always, always right, especially in this instance. That God has a way of weaving all things together for our good and for his glory, and Christmas reminds us of that. Christmas reminds us that God is working out his purposes and his timing, and his timing is always, always good. And so across town, Christmas truly is the most wonderful time of the year, but probably not for the reasons that you've been told. In fact, a lot of the reasons that you've been told 
probably lead to the lack of peace, hope, love, and joy that we all experience. Isn't that crazy? The time of year that we should have the most peace, like Tozer said, for six weeks, we lack it. The time where we should have the most sense of freedom, for a brief moment in time, we feel crushed by the weight of worry and financial difficulties. Why is that? I absolutely believe that we have an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything that matters to the heart of God. That's why you and I need to rediscover Christmas. That's why you and I need to be reminded of these all-important truths. And here's the beauty of it all. When you look at Christmas and you look at Jesus' genealogy, it reminds us that both the peasant, the failures, and the kings, and the good people all are together at the same table worshiping Jesus. And it was this newborn king that made that all possible. I want to invite our worship teams to come forward as we um, close in prayer and, and worship. Here at the Greece campus, we'll celebrate communion. Father, thank you for this wonderful time to look in your word. And um, it's fun, even in our own lives, to go on Ancestry.com or what other other websites there are uh, to find out our lineage and family history. And people spend thousands of dollars on, on that type of stuff and invest so much time, but yet you've provided it for us in your word. And so I ask um, God that you would help us appreciate what you've shown us today, that your timing is always perfect, that you've given grace for those who are outside. And Lord, help us continue to live a life that is pleasing and honoring to you. And as we do, whether we go through difficulties or hardships, in this month, when we experience a lack of peace, may we continue to fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. God, I pray that we would somehow, this month, learn to slow down and to pause on the incarnation and what this season is all about. For it's in Jesus' name we ask this. And all God's people said, amen.